Hey brothers and sisters, the title of today's message will be A Thief in a Night. And the focus of this message will be on the importance of keeping our garments as we watch and wait for the Lord's return. Um, so a few scriptures we're going to look at, and we're going to look at it briefly. And I feel by the time that we're done with this message, you will have a greater appreciation of why it is so important that the Lord tells us to keep our garments and what it actually means. So the aim here is for us to be ready to transition into the times that is yet ahead of us. The times of much change, the times of much shifting, the times of darkness, but also the time of light, the time where God will have, when God will have his way upon the earth through his people and so there's a certain conduct a certain way that we are called to walk in a season and so in sharing this brief message well i probably wouldn't say it's brief i i always say that it will be a brief message but it never turns out that way um but we're going to go ahead and start from the beginning in a book of genesis and walk through a few scriptures leading to the book of revelation so let us begin by looking at Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 21. And so beginning in Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her onto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So let's touch bases on a few things with the scripture, right? So to be naked, it means to be exposed. So when Adam and Eve were naked, they had nothing to be ashamed of. Well, they had nothing to be ashamed of because they were clean and they had a clear conscience about themselves. This is why in verse 25, it says that they were both naked and were not ashamed. So understand this that Adam and Eve were aware that they were naked. So it's not like they didn't have the knowledge of nakedness. For it says, and they were both naked, the man and the woman, and they were not ashamed, which mean, means they knew they were naked, but there was, there was a clear consciousness about them where there was nothing for them to feel bad about or be ashamed of. And so when we take the concept of a toddler, right? So a toddler has no shame in running around naked because their conscience is innocent and clean. They don't have that knowledge of good and evil because in their eyes, life is perfect. And for those who might have children or nieces and nephews or, cous or little cousins or anyone that has a child that you might have been encountered with, the funniest thing you would ever see a toddler do is when they take their diaper off and then they start taking off in a direction laughing because they know that they just that they're naked and they're running around and it's such a you know very adorable sight to see and when you look at the innocence of that child they're they're not ashamed you know there's nothing for them to be ashamed of and so in that perfect life of theirs what we know about a toddler is that they have no need of anything because they depend on their parents for all that they need. So when we look at Adam and Eve, they had that same kind of clear conscience as a toddler and had nothing to be ashamed of before God. They knew the Lord and walked closely with him. So in this, there was a personal relationship that Adam and Eve had with Jesus. And Jesus was, in fact, their covering. They were clothed in the glory of God because they were perfect. They were without sin. And so the glory of God 
was their covering which covered their nakedness. So whenever, and when we see this in scripture, whenever there is an encounter with God, sometimes there is that experience that happened where the glory of the Lord overshadows the person, where his glory covers them. When we go to Exodus chapter 34, it says, And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he had came down from the mountain, that Moses was not that he was, in, in other words, he was not aware that Moses was not, that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. So Moses, the amount of, the amount of time that Moses spent in the presence of the Lord, in the presence of the glory of the Lord, which was the 40 days as the Lord was given him the Ten Commandments, the glory of the Lord was absorbed into the body of Moses and overshadowed him. And so was it with Adam and Eve in the garden, is that that glory, that glory that the Lord um, radiates, it was absorbed into Adam and Eve. And so they had that glorified look about them because they were so near unto God, unto Jesus in the coolness of the garden. And so that glory was their covering and they had nothing to be ashamed, although they knew they were naked. Then when we go to Genesis chapter 3, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat it, eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So before we proceed in verse 4, get this, brothers and sisters. The Lord gave the command to Adam and Eve that they can eat of every tree in the garden with the exception of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which means that the tree of life was also for the eating, was also for the taking. Because Adam and Eve was already in a perfect state, they were in a sinless state, they were without sin. They had no sin in their life. They could have eaten from the tree of life and lived forever. And they had a choice that needed to be made. Either they would eat of the tree of life, obeying God and live forever, or be have their ears attentive to the words of the serpent and eat of the tree which God forbade them from doing. Which was the tree of the garden of good, what well, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so in verse 4 it says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God ha know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So Satan was tempting Eve and eventually Adam with the temptation of being their own God. And verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And it says, And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. So, which, what is interesting here is that they already knew, as we read in a previous scripture, that they were naked, but they were not ashamed. But yet, when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and disobeyed God, there was a new nakedness that they became aware of. A nakedness that made them ashamed because they just realized what they've done and what was lost because they knew they were naked but there was no sh sh there was no, no reason to be ashamed of it because the covering of God 
the glory of God was upon them because they were sinless. But once they sinned, that covering was gone. That glory was gone because now they became sinners. It was removed from them. And that's why they knew that they were naked because they lost their covering. And so they made aprons in the place of the glory of God, seeking to cover up their nakedness. And now verse number eight says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in a garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And so the key word here is presence. Because when you are in the same vicinity as the Lord, there is the presence of God, the glory of God. Adam and Eve never had an issue being in the very presence of God before. Because they were sinless. But now that their bodies has shifted to corruption, chances are they were not able to be in the presence of the Lord because of the glory that radiated, that made it hard for, for them to remain in the presence of the Lord. Verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Unto Adam all... Uh, on, I'm sorry. And it says, uh, after that, we move on to verse 21. And it says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God made coats of skin and clothe them. So the temptation of Satan, right? The temptation that Satan ultimately presented before Adam and Eve, Eve was the temptation to become their own God. This was also the temptation of Adam even though Eve was the one who was presented with that, uh, that offer from the serpent. So a lot of time, oftentimes, we want to blame Eve and trying to figure out if Eve somehow blamed Adam for what happened. But that is not the case. It is not the case because the woman, Eve, merely presented to Adam the exact same offer that Satan offered her. There was no deception in what Eve said. Eve told Adam exactly what the serpent told her, that you eat of this, you can become your own God. And Adam liked the idea. And so Adam and Eve were both presented with a choice at this point as to which God they would serve that day. Would it be Yahweh or Satan, the serpent, because both Yahweh and Satan provided information which contradicted each other. There's a contradiction in the word that Yahweh said in comparison to Satan and that Satan said in comparison to Yahweh. The words were in contradiction. So the voice that Adam and Eve hearkened to is the God they would choose to obey and serve that day. And so that day, Adam and Eve chose Satan, the serpent, as their God. And as a result, there was an exchanging of clothing. There was an exchanging of garments which took place that day. The clothing of God upon Adam and Eve was his crown of glory upon them. For that is the essence that make up the nature of God. Now, the contradiction, the opposite to that is the clothing of Satan upon Adam and Eve was his filthy coats of skin because that is the essence that makes up this that makes up Satan's nature ultimately. And so Adam and Eve, they exchanged the glory of God. They exchanged their crown for Satan's filthy coats of sin. And so the moment Adam and Eve made that choice, they stripped, they were stripped of their crown of glory. And that's why they realized they were naked. 
they realized that they were naked and without their covering. And so in its place, what the Lord gave to them was the very thing that they reaped. Filthy coats of sin. Now I know that the scripture says, says skin, but understand that the reason why they were given these coats of skin is because they had to cover their shame, their nakedness. And that coat will always be a remembrance to them of the sin that they committed when they decided that day to listen to the voice of Satan and to serve him as their Lord. So now to become naked serves as a reminder of the crown of glory that was lost due to rebellion only to be replaced with filthy coats of skin. Whereas if you know the, con the nature of a snake, right? In this case, whereas the serpent sheds its skin because of its inability to remain clean, so do we. We did this until the day that Jesus saved us from our sins. And so let's jump to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And it says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for this selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in a body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor, that whether presence or absence, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, he hath done whether it be good or bad. So because of what our Lord Jesus, our true God, has done for us on the cross, he made a way for our, for our crown of glory to be returned. And so also, let's not forget that the Lord Jesus had the Comforter sent, which is the Holy Spirit our crown of glory to restore us back to that relationship that man had lost because of sin. That relationship that man had in the garden with God. So to be sealed with the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, is to be once again clothed in the glory of God and our nakedness to be covered up once more as it was in the garden. And when we go to Galatians chapter three, it reminds us, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you, uh, many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So therefore, Christ becomes our garments. Christ becomes our covering. When we get baptized, we get sealed with the Holy Spirit. And so, when we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, mankind is once again restored. Those who receive Jesus, they're restored back to that same covering that Adam and Eve had when they walked with the Lord in the garden. And so therefore, because of the amazing work that Jesus did on the cross, although we are yet still sinners, we are still covered in the glory of God. Though we make mistakes, we are still covered and our nakedness is not shown. Because we're covered in Christ. We're covered, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit and sealed with our crown of glory. 
And so when we go to Matthew 22, it says, And when the king came to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how, comest, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So those who are not found clothed in Christ on that day will not enter into the wedding supper of the Lamb and shall be left out. So our wedding garments, brothers and sisters, is Christ. Christ is our covering. And so the question that I ask you, brothers and sisters, is how is your personal relationship with Jesus? Just having knowledge of scripture and being able to debate scripture with others in the body of Christ and just believing Jesus exists is not enough. You need to have that relationship, and that's why it is so important that you commit your time in this season right now to build that relationship up. When we go to James chapter 2, it says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So it's not enough just to have the knowledge of the scripture. It's not enough to just believe that Jesus Christ exists and knowing exactly by doctrine what he has done. Jesus need to be part of your life. He needs to be part of your heart. You need to have that personal relationship. Because what the Lord has done for mankind on the cross is restore us back to that relationship that Adam and Eve had with him in the garden. When we go to first, let's go to first Peter five and it says, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. And then Peter tells them, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And now look at this promise. It says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, Ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And so, brothers and sisters, our crown of glory will be seen for what it is on the day we put off the corruptible body in exchange for the incorruptible glorified ones. 1 Corinthians 15, 15 tells us, But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men and another flesh of beasts, another of fish and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star differ from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So a few words we're going to tie into this. It says, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. And it also speaks of the bodies. It says, there is, it says, it is sown a natural body and it is raised a spiritual body. So it is raised in glory and is raised a spiritual body. When we go back to 1 Peter 5, what did it say in verse 4? 
It says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So that crown of glory, brothers and sisters, is that incorruptible spiritual body that will radiate and reflect the glory of God. The same glory that Adam and Eve experienced and enjoyed when they were in the garden living a life without sin. And so when we go to Revelation chapter 3 and we speak of the church of Philadelphia, <clears throat> It says, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. He that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. And so, brothers and sisters, what was lost in the Garden of Eden because of rebellion was restored back to mankind on the cross. The glory that man once enjoyed as they walked in the cool of the day with the Lord as their covering has been won back for us through the triumphant resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so as the serpent in a garden convince Adam and Eve to surrender their crown of glory once, and they chose him as Lord, the serpent will once again. He has and he will seek to do it again in the end times during the Great Tribulation. But there is an outlet, a way out that is being given to his church, to God's church this day. To hold fast to your crown. To remain patient and to hold on to his testimony. This crown is that resurrected body, that glory that shall shine the glory of God. This is our covering. This is our clothing. This is our garment. And so the, the seal of the Holy Spirit is our assurance of keeping our crown. Our fight is to keep that assurance by faith and allow no one and nothing to make us renounce Jesus Christ as Lord. So we lose not our crown as it was in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. So let's go to Isaiah 62. And it says, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and a salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And a Gentile shall see thy righteousness, and all the kings thy glory and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. And it says here, brothers and sisters, in verse 3, Thou shalt also be a crown of glory, and the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. So, brothers and sisters, we in our glorified states, in our incorruptible, resurrected bodies, our transformed bodies, we become the crown of glory and a hand of the Lord. And so the day we put on bodies of incorruption, we enter into our heavenly states as God's crown of glory. We all become his, his crown, his royal diadem when we transform. 
This, brothers and sisters, is the same glorified bodies that Adam and Eve once had when their lives were without sin in the garden. They, they were God's crown. They were God's crown reflecting his glory. And yet we do have another example in the Gospels, which reflects this truth. How we had Jesus in a time of his transfiguration where Jesus who walked the earth without sin radiated the glory of God that Adam and Eve experienced as well when they walked that perfected life. And so in Matthew 17 it says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. Now here is the description of this of the crown, the manifestation of the crown of glory. And it says, And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them. And also in Mark chapter 9, it says, And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter, James, and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And it says again, He was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceedingly white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can wipe them. And there appeared unto them Elias and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And finally, Luke chapter 9. And it says, <clears throat> And it came to pass about in eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and James, James and John and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance were altered, and his raiment was white as glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. And so, right here, brothers and sisters, Jesus, who was a man, Jesus, our King, Jesus, God, who is God, who is the word who became flesh as one of us walked the earth as we did but he lived a perfect sinless life and so because of the perfection of his vessel of his life and that it was without sin nor even the touch of the corruption of sin what we see here is that he was transfigured which means he transitioned he changed from being the ordinary man into the glorified state. This here was a reversal, brothers and sisters, because Adam and Eve, their process was backwards. They were in that glorified state. But then because of sin, they transitioned from that glorified state and became as one without light, the typical man. And so Jesus and our spirits, brothers and sisters, if we were able to see into the spiritual realm of all of his children who are sealed with the Holy Spirit, you would see that magnificent light, that glory that shines, that crown of glory, which the Lord tells us to hold fast to what you have. Let no one take your crown. Let no one enter into your heart. Let no one enter, enter into your mind to take your peace, to take your peace away to take away God's place in your heart. To make you turn your back on the Lord and running after the things of the world. And trying to lead you to renounce Jesus as Lord of your life. He says, hold fast to your crown. Hold fast to the, to the promise. Hold fast to the seal of the Holy Spirit in you. Hold fast to your crown. And so finally, brothers and sisters, Revelation 16, and it says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great rivers Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up the way of the kings of the east 
that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirit-like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And the Lord tells us, in verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So, brothers and sisters, our duty as Christians, as royal sons and daughters to the king, is to be on the alert. We are to be watchful for the return of Jesus. We are to keep our garments on by remaining in a close walk with Jesus Christ. Remaining clothed in him and his glory as it was in the days of the garden. To be found naked is to be without God's covering. This is to be found outside your relationship with God, outside your obedience to his will, outside the tree of life, and turned back into the world, seeking to be your own God, practicing the fruits of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, clothed in Satan's coats of sin. So now, brothers and sisters, as the days of us grows darker in the world, what Christians will begin to find in these times is that they will find their priorities begin to shift as our lives is going to be reduced down to basic sheer survival in the matter of walking a committed Christian walk with Jesus. Holding onto our crown will be the only thing in the forefront of our minds. And so this day, today, do not delay in drawing near in your personal relationship with Jesus. This may be the only thing you have left when all other comforts are taken away from you. As the scripture says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. <laughs>